The Secret of Success In every chapter of this book, mention is made of the money-making secret that has made fortunes for the exceedingly wealthy men whom I have carefully analyzed over a long period of years. The secret was first brought to my attention by Andrew Carnegie. The canny, lovable old Scotsman carelessly tossed it into my mind when I was but a boy. Then he sat back in his chair, with a merry twinkle in his eyes, and watched carefully to see if I had brains enough to understand the full significance of what he'd said to me. When he saw that I had grasped the idea, he asked if I would be willing to spend twenty years or more preparing myself to take it to the world, to men and women who, without the secret, might go through life as failures. I said I would, and with Mr. Carnegie's cooperation, I have kept my promise. Editor's Comments in 1908, during a particularly downtime in the U.S. economy and with no money and no work, Napoleon Hill took a job as a writer for Bob Taylor's magazine. He was hired to write success stories about famous men. Although it would not provide much in the way of income, it offered Hill the opportunity to meet and profile the giants of industry and business, the first of whom was the creator of America's steel industry, multimillionaire Andrew Carnegie, who was to become Hill's mentor. Carnegie was so impressed by Hill's perceptive mind that following their three-hour interview, he invited Hill to spend the weekend at his estate so they could continue the discussion. During the course of the next two days, Carnegie told Hill that he believed any person could achieve greatness if they understood the philosophy of success and the steps required to achieve it. It's a shame, he said that each new generation must find the way to success by trial and error when the principles are really clear-cut. Carnegie went on to explain his theory that his knowledge could be gained by interviewing those who had achieved greatness and then compiling the information and research into a comprehensive set of principles. He believed that it would take at least 20 years and that the result would be the world's first philosophy of individual achievement. He offered Hill the challenge, for no more compensation than that Carnegie would make the necessary introductions and cover travel expenses. It took Hill 29 seconds to accept Carnegie's proposal. Carnegie told him afterward that had it taken him more than 60 seconds to make the decision, he would have withdrawn the offer, for a man who cannot reach a decision promptly, once he has all the necessary facts, cannot be depended upon to carry through any decision he may make. It was through Hill's unwavering dedication that this book was eventually written. For detailed information on the life of Hill, read or listen to the audiobook of A Lifetime of Riches, The Biography of Napoleon Hill by Michael J. Ritt, Jr. and Kurt Landers. Michael Ritt worked as Hill's assistant for ten years and was the first employee of the Napoleon Hill Foundation where he served as executive director, secretary, and treasurer. The material in his book comes from his own personal knowledge of Hill, as well as from Hill's unpublished autobiography. That is the end of the editor's comment. This book, Think and Grow Rich, contains the Carnegie Secret, a secret that has been tested by thousands, now millions of people in almost every walk of life. It was Mr. Carnegie's idea that the magic formula, which gave him a stupendous fortune, ought to be placed within reach of people who do not have the time to investigate how others had made their money. It was his hope that I might test and demonstrate the soundness of the formula through the experience of men and women in every calling. He believed the formula should be taught in all public schools and colleges. He said that if it were properly taught, it would revolutionize the entire educational system and the time spent in school could be reduced to less than half. In Chapter 4, On Faith, you will read the astounding story of the organization of the giant United States Steel Corporation. It was conceived and carried out by one of the young men through whom Mr. Carnegie proved that his formula will work for all who are ready for it. This single application of the secret by Charles M. Schwab made him a huge fortune in both money and opportunity. Roughly speaking, this particular application of the formula was worth $600 million. These facts give you a fair idea of what reading this book may bring to you, provided you know what it is that you want. Editor's Comment
According to one method of calculation, through inflation alone, it would take approximately $20 in 2001 to buy what $1 would have bought in 1901. However, to find the contemporary equivalent value of $600 million is not simply a matter of multiplying by the increase in the cost of living. Although there are other factors and variables in calculating buying power, even by conservative estimates, the $600 million would translate into at least $12 billion at the beginning of the 21st century. That's the end of the editor's comment. The secret was passed on to thousands of men and women who have used it for their personal benefit. Some have made fortunes with it. Others have used it successfully in creating harmony in their homes. A clergyman used it so effectively that it brought him an income of upwards of $75,000 a year, approximately $1.5 million in contemporary terms. Arthur Nash, a Cincinnati tailor, used his near-bankrupt business as a guinea pig on which to test the formula. The business came to life and made a fortune for its owners. The experiment was so unique that newspapers and magazines gave it millions of dollars' worth of publicity. The secret was passed on to Stuart Austin Weir of Dallas, Texas. He was ready for it, so ready that he gave up his profession and studied law. Did he succeed? You'll read the answer in Chapter 6, Specialized Knowledge. While I was the advertising manager of the LaSalle Extension University, I had the privilege of seeing J. G. Chaplin, president of the university, use the formula so effectively that he made LaSalle one of the great extension schools of this country. The secret is mentioned no fewer than a hundred times throughout this book. It has not been directly named, for it seems to work more successfully when it is merely left in sight, where those who are ready and searching for it may pick it up. That is why Andrew Carnegie passed it to me without giving me its specific name. If you are ready to put it to use, you will recognize this secret at least once in every chapter but you will not find an explanation of how you will know if you are ready. That would deprive you of much of the benefit you will receive when you make the discovery in your own way. If you have ever been discouraged, if you have had difficulties that took the very soul out of you, if you have tried and failed, if you were ever handicapped by illness or physical affliction, the story of my own son's discovery and use of the Carnegie formula may prove to be the oasis in the desert of lost hope for which you have been searching. This secret was extensively used by President Woodrow Wilson during the World War and by President Roosevelt during the Second World War. It was passed on to every soldier in the training received before going to the front. President Wilson told me it was a powerful factor in raising the funds needed for the war. A peculiar thing about this secret is that those who acquire and use it find themselves literally swept on to success. However, as is often pointed out in this book, there is no such thing as something for nothing. The secret cannot be had without paying a price, although the price is far less than its value. Another peculiarity is that the secret cannot be given away, and it cannot be purchased for money. Unless you are intentionally searching for the secret, you cannot have it at any price. That is because the secret comes in two parts, and in order for you to get it, one of those parts must already be in your possession. The secret will work for anyone who is ready for it. Education has nothing to do with it. Long before I was born, the secret had found its way into the possession of Thomas A. Edison, and he used it so intelligently that he became the world's leading inventor although he had only three months of schooling. The secret was passed on to Edwin C. Barnes, a business associate of Mr. Edison's. He used it so effectively that he accumulated a great fortune and retired from active business while still a young man. You will find his story at the beginning of the next chapter. It should convince you that riches are not beyond your reach, and that no matter where you are in life, you can still be what you wish to be. Money, Fame, recognition, and happiness can be had by you if you are ready and determined to have these blessings. How do I know these things? You should have the answer before you finish this book. You may find it in the very first chapter or on the last page.
While I was doing the research that I had undertaken at Andrew Carnegie's request, I analyzed hundreds of well-known men. Many of them attributed the accumulation of their vast fortunes to the Carnegie secret. Among these men were Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Automobile Company. Ford started with no money and little education, yet became one of the most successful self-made businessmen in American history. William Wrigley, Jr., a traveling salesman who found that his customers liked the chewing gum he gave away as a premium better than the goods he sold, so he started his own company. John Wanamaker, known as the Merchant Prince, he created the world's first department store and was hailed for his innovations in marketing, customer service, and employee benefits. James J. Hill, known as the Empire Builder, he built the transcontinental Great Northern Railway encouraged homesteading in the West, then established shipping routes linking America to Asia. George S. Parker, a school teacher who grew tired of fixing his students' pens, he created a new design, founded the Parker Pen Company, and turned a simple idea into a fortune. E.M. Statler, the son of a poor pastor, he started as a bellboy and worked his way up until he was able to start his own chain of Statler Hotels, famous for their luxury and service with a smile. Henry L. Doherty Started at age 12 as an office boy for Columbia Gas, he went on to acquire 53 utilities companies and patented 140 innovations for natural gas and oil production. Cyrus H. K. Curtis Starting with a small agricultural weekly, Curtis turned it into Ladies' Home Journal, created Saturday Evening Post, then assembled one of the largest newspaper empires. George Eastman, inventor and founder of the Eastman Kodak Company, he created many of the innovations that popularized photography and transformed the motion picture industry. Charles M. Schwab, the right-hand man of Andrew Carnegie, he was president of Carnegie Steel Company, brokered the deal that formed U.S. Steel, and went on to found Bethlehem Steel. Theodore Roosevelt, 26th President of the United States from 1901 to 1909. John W. Davis, a lawyer and political leader, Davis was Solicitor General under President Woodrow Wilson and later appointed Ambassador to Great Britain. Albert Hubbard, philosopher, publisher of the Fra magazine, and founder of the Roy Crofter's Artist Colony, Hubbard was also the author of many bestsellers, including A Message to Garcia. Wilbur Wright, a bicycle shop owner who, with his brother Orville, became the first Americans to fly heavier-than-air aircraft and pioneered the aviation industry. William Jennings Bryan, Newspaper publisher, presidential nominee, Secretary of State under President William McKinley, but perhaps best known as the lawyer who defended creationism at the Scopes Monkey Trial. Dr. David Starr Jordan, educator, scientist, author of over 50 books, he was the nation's youngest university president at Indiana University and became the first president of Stanford University. J. Ogden Armour, Inherited his family's meatpacking business, turned it into a conglomerate with more than 3,000 products, was an owner of the Chicago Cubs, and a director of National City Bank and American International Corporation. Arthur Brisbane A crusading journalist and syndicated columnist, Brisbane was sought after by every major news organization and was the most read and highest paid editorial writer of his day. Dr. Frank Gonzalez a Chicago preacher who delivered such a powerful sermon, Philip D. Armour gave him a million dollars to start the Armour Institute of Technology, of which he became president. Daniel Willard, president of the B&O Railroad for more than 30 years, he was honored by having the city of Willard, Ohio, named for him. King Gillette, a traveling salesman and born tinkerer, Gillette was trying to shave on a moving train when he came up with the idea of the safety razor, which became the foundation of a corporate giant. Ralph A. Weeks, president of International Correspondence Schools, 
Weeks helped finance Napoleon Hill's Intrawall Institute, established to educate and rehabilitate prison inmates. Judge Daniel T. Wright, instructor at Georgetown Law School, where Napoleon Hill was studying when Bob Taylor's magazine gave him the assignment to write a profile of Andrew Carnegie. John D. Rockefeller. With $1,000 in savings plus another $1,000 borrowed from his father, he started a kerosene company which he grew into the giant Standard Oil and one of the world's greatest fortunes.